the bandwidth and everything else can be great. So having said this, um, yeah, I'd like to say hello to everyone. Um, Michael here, Michael Rose, and it's an absolute pleasure that this afternoon, or for our guest speaker this morning, we, we kick off a, a new series called uh, HDRs in, in Conversation. And this was inspired by our recent uh, PhD colloquia that was incredibly insightful, it created momentum, it was fantastic to see uh, everyone come together and especially identify the similarities uh, when it comes to research questions, methods, uh, but also opportunities and problems um, that we saw across all four themes in our center. Uh, and today we want to bring some regularity to it and it's an absolute pleasure that, that we start with the, with the biggest possible hotshot we could find on the planet. Um, before I introduce our guest speaker, the usual habits, I, I encourage you to please switch off uh, video and audio. Um, in roughly half an hour, and we have plenty of time for Q&A, uh, we stop sharing slides, everybody can see everyone. So uh, if you just be with us for the next half an hour. And of course, in the tradition of QT, I like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners on, of the land on, on which we now largely e-meet this afternoon. And I like to acknowledge the Turbal and Yoga as the First Nations owners of the lands where QT now stands. We pay respect to the elders, laws, customs, and creation spirits. And of course, we recognize that these lands have always been places of teaching, research, and learning. QT acknowledges in particular the important role the original and Torres Strait Islander people play within our QT community. Yeah, dear students, um, you are in, in for a big treat in the next hour of your life. And as I highlighted, uh, when we thought about, well, how can we continue our PhD colloquium? How can we keep on creating value, inspiration, education, guidance, um, and, and provide uh, important insights for the journey ahead for you as a PhD student? Um, the first person that by far came to our mind uh, was our old friend Jan Wecker. Uh, some of you might have um, met Jan, who, who spent a substantial um, time of his still young life here in Brisbane, uh, and he went all the way uh, from a student to a professor. Um, he looks back not just only at a PhD um, that he received here from QT 12 years ago, and he worked here until three years ago, 27. Um, but it's amazing uh, how he did not just create a big step uh, for, for Brisbane, uh, for, for global humankind. Um, in 2018, he was named the youngest ever fellow of the Association of Information Systems. And, and the AIS, as you probably know, is one of those conservative fellows, uh, uh, groups, where in order to become a fellow, you, you have to look back typically as decades of impact. A year later, in 2019, he was named the number one business researcher under 40 by the German magazine Wirtschaftswoche. So the idea is uh, to, to look at the credentials and publications and, and to be picked number one in a highly competitive field is an absolutely outstanding achievement. Um, and it's not just the publications um, that are easy to count, it's the contribution to the community, uh, I think that characterize uh, high achievers and high impact individuals um, from those who, who play a different game uh, so Jan always looks back at, at, at history as an editor-in-chief and, and for many, many years he did not just manage and lead but really transformed the communications of the AIS, one of the top journals in the field of information systems. Um, he's a senior editor uh, for MS Quarterly, one of, of, of the standout um, journals. Uh, and he does not only create great lectures, uh, publishes as well and, and nurtures um, incoming uh, publications, he also, very much aligned with the spirit of QT, is well attached and aligned with the outside world. Um, and that includes very big organizations. He was the chair for retail innovation funded by Woolworths. He worked closely with SAP Combank, uh, and more recently back in Germany with Lufthansa and Ubiso. Uh, Jan is today, as you can see, a chair professor for information systems at one of the most outstanding universities in Europe, the University of Cologne. Uh, he's also, um, part of the circle of trust of the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation and a lifelong fellow. And we're absolutely honored and delighted. Um, and of course, he continues his uh, work with us in the role of an adjunct professor. Um, Jan has published comprehensively and uh, in addition to journals and, and articles published at conferences, published a number of books 
Um, one of them is about the PhD journey. Um, and, and these books have influenced uh, hundreds of institutions in more than 60 countries globally. Um, the next 30 minutes will only give you a, a brief insight into the tremendous talent, but also generosity that, that Jan puts forward. Um, he titles um, the next 30 minutes of his presentation, Optimizing Your PhD. So ladies and gentlemen, please, um, big round of applause if you could, but, but on behalf of all of us, uh, Jan, we are totally delighted that on an early morning you spend an hour with us. So I hand over the stage to you, uh, but I, I really, really appreciate what you're doing here for us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. Welcome, everybody. Um, how do I start? Well, I'll start with, um, I, I'm at, in my home office, right? So I'm in Europe, we, we still have uh, some Corona lockdown measures. So I'm, I'm at home, as you may see. And um, uh, internet gets a little uh, wonky every now and then. So uh, it could be that I, that I drop out for a second. I always come back, don't worry about it, okay? Um, so thanks for these words. I mean, I, I just looked at the picture. It's a picture from this year and, uh, you know, you, you, we are getting older. <laughs> That's what I felt. And it's also when these, these sort of accolades, uh, they get longer, it, it's usually just a sign that you're getting older. That's all it means, really. <laughs> so, uh, you know, if you have a nice, short and sharp introduction, it means that you're young and, uh, um, and, and, and not as old as me. So, okay. Um, so, the, the, the plan was, of course, that I'd be with you today. And that was, that was uh, long planned. Um, I love QT. I'm a very, very proud um, student and, and adjunct of, of QT and a very proud student of Michael. He didn't mention that, but he was my advisor um, during my PhD and, uh, and I guess a, a mentor ever since. So, um, you know, a lot of what I have to say goes back to, to the experience I've made at QT, a, a university that I've always felt had a, had a wonderful um, view of what research is about. And uh, of course, a lot of my ideas go back to, to Michael's, right? So I, the older I get, I feel that uh, more and more, I'm, I'm just a student of the, the school of thought that, teach, that taught me, right? So um, I tend to create too many slides. I'm, I'm trying to get through this. I, I do have some questions to you guys in, uh, you know, while I go ahead. So um, maybe get prepared to, to unmute yourself and then answer a few questions when, when I ask you, okay? Um, otherwise, you can, you can interrupt me at any time, but we can also do this later. But I do want to get a little bit of interaction into this. Um, I'm going to skip this um, because this is, this is my usual, this is what I do slide. Um, I basically study how, how firms deal with uh, digital innovation, I guess. Um, and I typically focus on two types of firms, either very, very big ones, like the Woolies of this world, Lufthansa, SAP, or the very, very small ones. But I wanted to draw attention to two aspects of this work because they come back later in my slides. Number one, um, all the small firms, which are the, the, the little logos that you see on the top right, um, they are all sustainability uh, companies. They're all in the space of circular economy, of sustainable development. They do parts of them do deal with recycling, with repair, with reuse, with reselling. So they're all branded, not only by being businesses that use IT, but businesses that try to do well by doing good. Okay, so this is one of, one of my areas because I think it's important. Yeah, not because anyone told me or not because of the biggest issue of the day, but I think it's an important issue to address. Um, the second um, aspect that I wanted to highlight here as well, at the bottom, you see two names. One of them is the Robert Koch Institute and the other one is Esri. Uh, Robert Koch Institute, you may not have heard of. That's basically the central health authority in Germany dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah, so sort of like uh, you may have heard of Fauci in, in New York. Uh, calling the shots, more or less. Uh, we have the same institution in Germany. I'm sure you have a similar institute in Australia as well. Um, and they work with technology providers such as Esri. And Esri is building these dashboards that I'm pretty sure you would have seen. Yeah, the one by the John Hopkins University, the one by the uh, Robert Koch Institute, the World Health Organization, and all the other ones you would have seen. Most of them come from this platform provider called Esri. And as the uh, pandemic uh, uh, started, I reached out to these both players and said, I want to help you. I want to, I want to work with you. I want to, I can't help you build a vaccine. I can't really help you figure out what the best lockdown measures are, but I know information systems. Now, I can help. I can help with at least you building these platforms in these information systems the best possible way. Um, and that is, is a message I wanted to get across later on. So I'll come back to this example in a little bit. 
Okay, I want to talk about three things today. So I have three messages under this umbrella topic of optimizing your PhD. So sort of how do you how do you make the most of that experience and how do you set yourself in a position that you can leapfrog from your PhD into whatever comes afterwards, okay? So, and if I have to distill my experiences and my learnings from that um, into three things, this is what they are. So as I said, I've been a QT PhD student myself. Um, I supervised, I think, a 10 or 11 PhD students at QT as well. And um, I've been in a direct, a, a program director for the PhD program at QT and now in here Cologne. So I see a lot of PhD students at all the different stages. And I see, especially as a program director, you, you tend to see a lot of the problem cases, right? And the problems and the challenges and the, you know, the hardship that, that students go through. So, um, I, and I try to instill some of these things um, into, into three messages. So number one, I want to talk a little bit about what I think are hygiene and motivator skills. So things you need to get under control and things that really make a difference in your PhD experience. The second thing is, is a mantra that I think QT is actually not only displaying, but also executing really, really well, which is engagement. Yeah, engage scholarship, um, industry engagement, industry connection, whatever you want to call it, really practice a university for the real world. And the third thing is how to build from your PhD, how to build a program from a project, how to expand and do so that you get network effects so that you basically get exponential value for what you're putting in. Okay. So I want to talk through these three things. And as I said, if you have any questions, just feel free to interrupt me anytime. So the first thing I want to talk about is that I think in anything that we do, and especially in a PhD, there are hygiene factors and motivator factors. Um, I'm assuming you know what the differences are, but if not, the, the key idea between these two things is that there are, there are two different um, types of uh, skills or factors that are relevant. One of which hygiene factors, you only notice when you're absent. So when you're, when you have them, then no one cares. But if you don't have them, then people start noticing and start experiencing dissatisfaction. A brilliant example from the Corona time were uh, toilet paper. Right? No one cares. No one notices that you have toilet paper. But as soon as toilet paper runs out, it's a big thing. Okay. So the other thing is the one's called the motivator factor. A motivator factor isn't necessary, so to speak. But if you have it, it really disproportionately adds to the success. Okay. So hygiene and motivator factors. Um, the key thing here is how you can manage them. Hygiene factors, you need to get under control. Yeah. And motivator factors, you need to build and nurture. These are two different things. Hygiene factors, you need to make sure that you reach a certain level to make sure that the absence isn't felt. And motivators factors are, are the key things that you really got to invest in to make a difference. So I wanted to ask you, what do you think are some hygiene factors in, in doing a PhD? What are the things that are, you need to get under control that no one notices unless you, you don't have them, unless you don't have them under control? Any idea? Yes, please. Uh, so I might jump in here. I think maybe one is potentially like time management. It's something that uh, when you have it, you kind of, you are just, you know, uh, getting to everything at the right time and meeting deadlines, but uh, so no one really notices. But if you don't have it, I think it would be quite a, quite obvious Perfect. as well. So Wonderful. Perfect example. Time management is, is definitely a hygiene factor. Eh? We only start noticing time management uh, when, when you don't have it, because then you don't meet the deadlines and then, you know, all the QT escalation procedures come into play. Right, so that that is definitely a hygiene factor. You don't get a prize for having the most time efficient PhD, yeah, but uh, you get into trouble if you don't, uh, you know, fall within the range of the expected time and completion. Br brilliant example. So let me talk about a few that I think are really important. Number one is rigor in your methods. Yeah, rigor in your methods. So with rigor, I mean that you execute your research procedures in whatever is called the standard of the day. So whether that's a survey, an experiment, design, case studies, action research, I don't care. Well, whatever it is, it is expected of you to be extremely rigorous. Now, the, the, the flip side to that is you will not get any benefits from being rigorous. 
Yeah, everyone expects you to be rigorous. That's it, right? So you can never write a paper. You can never go out of your PhD with a claim saying, "Oh, I've been particularly rigorous here." You know, one of my contributions is that I found a rigorous way of doing this, this, and that. No one cares. But as soon as you lack rigor, as soon as your research procedures are not up to scratch, not up to the latest standards, do not follow the latest published guidelines, um, you run into trouble. So that is a very clear hygiene factor. It used to be different, yeah? So make no mistake. So the, the, the role of rigor was different 10, 20, 30 years ago. Maybe then it was a motivator factor. Maybe then in a pool of people doing things pretty randomly, maybe, rigor was a key differentiating criterion. Let me tell you, it is not. Yeah, so the expectation of the academic world is that you're rigorous. Number two, command of the literature. Command of the literature means that within the topic area that you've chosen, the resilient company, uh, digital innovation, I don't know, disaster management, whatever it may be, um, everyone expects you to know all the literature. Yeah, everything that pertains to this. So that means if someone says, have you heard of the study by X, you would always say, yes, I know this. Yes, I've read this. Yes, I know that there are seven different theoretical perspectives. I don't like any one of them, but I know them, okay? So again, command of the literature is another one of these skills that you need to get into place. And again, you don't get a, a penny price for this, but you know, if you don't have that, it'll, it'll, it'll show up as negative. And the third thing is you don't get away without theory. Yeah, so you need to have your own theoretical foundation under control, whatever it may be. But if you're building on some foundation, on some meta theory, some grand theory, whatever it may be, again, people expect you that you know this inside out. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to give a very stupid example here. Let's say you work on adoption and you're working with technology acceptance model, which is one of those theories that most people know. Uh, people expect you to know this inside out. Yeah. <clears throat> and the fourth hygiene factor that I want to want to talk a little bit more about is actually writing. And that's a difficult one because we don't teach that very well. And we teach you about rigor, we teach you about literature, we teach you about theory. Very poorly and very rarely do we talk about writing. Yeah. Um, I'll talk about that in a second a little bit more, but here place it. It is part of the game that you need to be able to communicate your ideas and you need to do that well. You need to write well because if you don't write well, you can't display any of the other things that you're going to control. You can't talk about rigor without being able to express rigor. Okay, uh, let's talk about motivator factors. Uh, what do you think are motivator factors that, that really can make a difference if done well in a PhD experience? Any idea? Time management was a good example for, for, for a uh, hygiene factor. Yes, please. Uh, maybe some form of, um, I would say like visual communication or something that uh, knowing how to present or pitch. So when you're at conferences and things like that, it's kind of, you can, um, I don't know, kind of communicate your ideas like verbally as well. Uh, yeah, I think that's a great skill to have. I like it. Uh, I haven't thought of that one, but uh, I like it very much. It will be very helpful, especially as you come towards your PhD, because remember, you know, you don't only have that PDF that you hand in, but you also got to, you got to talk about it, right? You got to defend it. You need to present your work. You need to socialize your work. Um, a lot of that is in interpersonal communication skills and so forth. And mine are really, mine are really 1990s. <laughs> I grew up with PowerPoints. I'm still sort of first generation slide builder. Yeah. So I know that there are way better uh, uh, ways to present your ideas than what I'm doing here. So I, I like, I like this example. Okay. So this is what I came up with. So relevance, um, I briefly mentioned sort of Corona pandemic and what it means, for example, for information systems, which is my field. Uh, yeah. Um, there are just things that are really, really relevant. Um, and that is obviously a motivator factor for a certain time, because if you do things that are rigorous, you know, with foundations and you write about them well, and they're about really relevant topic, that's a huge plus. It doesn't, it doesn't need to be. Yeah. But it's, it's a huge plus, right? So when I say it doesn't need to be, you can still write about adoption. You can write about enterprise systems if you wanted to. Uh, but, you know, if you write a paper that is about, you know, Corona dashboards or Corona tracing apps or, I don't know, uh, models for spreading the vaccine next year, they, they are hugely relevant at the moment, right? So that can be a very big motivator factor. 
Um, the second motivator factor is your choice of phenomenon. Yeah, so that is basically coupled with relevance, but it's a little bit different, right? So the phenomenon um, could be, again, it could be relevant to phenomenon, it could be complex, it could be um, societal, it could be, you know, emotional, whatever it is, but that is usually, again, a motivator factor. People love new phenomena, people love to learn something about a new thing that's coming out. And that, again, is a motivator factor that is really can, can give you a boost. That's a difficult thing to do uh, for a PhD because you have to pick one and then you have to do research on it for three, four, five years. Um, so, you know, it's hard to pick a phenomenon at the right point in time that it's really going to fly for the next couple of years. But it is possible, right? So a couple of years ago, this would have been research, let's say, on blockchain. It probably still is. There's still room to do good work on IoT, for example. Um, there's a variety of things we can look at in uh, shared autonomous electric vehicles, right? That's still a, a, an emergent phenomenon. And there's a few others, right? Post-corona world is a, is a phenomenon that's only emerging at the moment because obviously we're not post-corona yet. So these are all phenomena that are really interesting. And a third motivator factor is that somehow the data that you're working with is unique, uniquely different, I should have said, uniquely different to what we normally do. Yeah, so that does not mean that in a world where everybody else does survey research, you, you add a, it could be that you have some unique access to uh, some insights that usually people are hard, are hard can, for people it's really hard to obtain. Yeah, and when we worked with Woolworth for a couple of years at QT, we had some very unique data access opportunity because we were deep inside the company and they gave us a lot of data that normally researchers wouldn't necessarily get. So that's a unique opportunity and that can really make a difference as well. So now that you heard about the, some of these mod motivator hygiene factors, the key question is of course, how do we manage them, right? So hygiene skills, we need to optimize and we need to get, get them under control, but also importantly, we shouldn't overinvest in them. Yeah, we need to get them out of control until they're to the level of expectation. But everything else you put into them is not gonna, it's not gonna go beyond expectation. It's just gonna stay there, right? So we need to optimize and do that efficiently. How do we do this? Yeah, so for the command of the literature, for rigor, and writing, for example. Um, so number one, a very clear example is whatever method you you pick for your for your PhD survey, case study, design, whatever. Make sure that in your supervisory team, you have someone that is an expert on this. And with an expert, I mean like a demonstrated expert, someone that is demonstrably really good in this method. Now, very often, and that's why I write co-supervisor, that doesn't need to be, and I sometimes think it shouldn't be your primary supervisor. But it's really helpful to have that in your supervisory team, maybe as an associate supervisor, as a co-supervisor, someone that really knows experiments inside out or really knows software implementation inside out, or whatever it may be, yeah? You cannot learn something if people that are trying to teach you don't know this stuff. It's very simple, but it's a hygiene factor that PhD students very often get wrong, yeah? So that's, that's the number one advice to, opt to, to get your hygiene skills under control. These people know rigor, um, and they can tell you if you're doing something wrong, and they can point you to the right guidance and so forth. The second key thing that I really encourage all PhD students is, you do have some course requirements. In every university, basically, you have to do a little bit of coursework for your PhD. Very often, it's to instill rigor, right? So teach you a few methods and stuff like this. But also, and especially at QT, you can attend all sorts of workshops. Yeah, there are workshops left, right, and center on all sorts of very meaningful things, whether it be writing, whether it be time management, um, project management, or even detailed skills in, 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 in one method or the other. Go go to these workshops as often and as much as you can. I, I still do, yeah? So I've been doing this for, for almost 20 years now, and I go to workshops whenever I can, try to learn new things, trying to keep abreast and keep, stay on top of what we're doing in, um, in method, okay? Third thing, workshop your papers. So when you write, don't just write it and submit it to something, uh, some venue outlet, workshop it. Workshop your ideas, present, send drafts, send drafts to friends, and so forth. And finally, read, read as much as you can. So I wanted to spend a, a second on this as well, on this aspect of reading and writing. Yeah, I like this quote um, that says, as a scientist, you're always also a writer. You're always an author. 
So an author is an author, but a scientist is an author and a scientist. Okay. So the way that I handle it, um, thankfully, I love reading books. I've always been a big literature fan, but the way you can ask yourself is sort of like, okay, how many books do you read? And I'm not talking about a, a research methods textbook or the latest textbook on, on your topic area. I'm talking about books, novels, yeah, anything really. Um, so these are some guiding questions that you can ask um, that will really help for you. How many books have you read? What is a great book that you've read and why do you think it's great? Who's a great writer and why? So for example, my favorite writers are Hi um, Hemingway and John Steinbeck, two American novelists from the 20th century because very simply their writing is the most elegant and clean and simplest writing I've ever seen. They don't write complicated. They write very clean and simple and it's, it's tremendously beautiful. So I try to write the same way. I don't, but I try. Okay. Um, what I also do very often is that when I read an article that I really like a, a research article, it's very often I like it because it's written so well. And then I take note, I take note of the people that wrote this article and I look up other articles that I've read. And if it's an article that really talks very nicely about a case study, I write down, this is a great case study. And next time I'm writing a case study myself, I'm going back to it and using it as a template. And I try to write, write the same way. Okay, how do we, how do we talk to nerd? How do we nurture and motivate the skills? How do we invest in them? So to figure out what's relevant and what a good phenomenon, you gotta go into the outside world. Yeah, you will not figure out what's relevant by reading an academic paper that lists the top 10 relevant things. They're always dated. They're always backward looking. So one of the reasons by the time it comes out, it's been three years in the making. Yeah. So the phenomena that we're interested in do not move as slowly as how we're writing about them. Right. So you got to go outside into the world and figure out what, what's relevant to the world and not what's relevant to a journal. Yeah. Um, you can follow, of course, content alerts and figure out what's relevant to the academic community. You can go to industry events, talk to people, read industry press, read the newspaper, figure out what's relevant in society these days. And very importantly, in your own work, never follow the trap of, we followed the approach, blah, 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 that's been accepted, or this is the standard way of doing things. It is always the past standard way of doing things. So that's always a trap. So as soon as you find yourself doing, we follow this approach because it's been used very often and then you put in three, four references, you might be dated. It might not be the latest anymore. You might already fall into the hygiene factor trap here. Yeah. And the final things is by, try to be driven by, not by method theory or academic problems, try to be driven by phenomena. By phenomena, I mean by things that are out there um, that are present problems to this planet, not problems to academics, yeah, or not problems by people that are interested in rigor, yeah. Problems that we have in our uh, literature, so I don't know, uh, Delphi studies, uh, editorials that say we gotta do more research on X, that are always historical, they have to be, they're always backward looking, they always have talk about stuff that they, people wrote about a couple of years ago. It takes a couple of years to get this stuff published. So it's always old stuff that you're looking at, right? So phenomena driven research goes out and looks at the real world and finds puzzle in the real world. Yeah, I'm not trying to find holes in the literature. I'm not reading um, all the great writers and the philosophers and find, oh my God, they didn't figure this one out. I'm gonna do this, but I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna talk to people and see what really concerns them at the moment. And if I'm equipped with rigor, and if I'm equipped with the command of the literature, I always got to find problems that are real phenomena and also a problem in the literature. That part is different, right? So try to go out. That's what I do. Try, anyway, I try to figure out what's going on in the real world and ask the question, why is that? Yeah. Why, why do I see what I'm seeing here? So if I give you a few that are really big at the moment, uh, the pandemic obviously, and the infodemic that comes with this, um, if you look at the, the U.S. election that happened a couple of weeks ago, I mean, that's an amazing thing to look at and ask yourself, what, why is this happening this particular way? You know, what is the role of technology here? I mean, there, there are so many things that we could look at just by looking at our doorstep. You can look at Fridays for Future, climate uh, change and all these topics and ask, why, why, is, this, why is this happening now? What, what's different and so forth? Yeah. And this is a nice leapfrog to the second point, which is my message of practicing against scholarship. Um, yeah. 
So not just writing a paper, not just figuring out a theoretical problem or improving method X, but really try to make a difference. And that's very important also to a very hardcore ivory tower type of academic, because I think there's a big misconception about this, this publish or perish game that you may have heard of, right? Publish or perish is typically when we talk about the currency of PhD students or of professors is how many papers they publish and what their citation indexes and stuff like this. Right. And we, we, we tend to think that people that publish more are more successful and that's just plain wrong. Publish or perish is not about success. It's about survival. Yeah. One of the parts of the game of an academic is you need to publish. And I think it's a good part of the game because you know, what, what good is when you do research and you know stuff in the world doesn't know about it. So we got to put it out there and the best or at the moment, the, the most effective way we have is to write about it. Yeah, there might be other ways, but that's usually the traditional way of doing it. So that's fine, but that's just, that's just an hygiene factor, really. Yeah. So you putting out papers left, right and center is not impact. You don't succeed as a scientist by getting papers published. You succeed by creating impact. Yeah. And then the question is not, well, how many papers have you published, but what's the impact that you generated? Any idea what I mean with impact? What could that be? What could be impact? Anyone? Uh, so we've got someone in the Q&A um, just asking, well, saying that potentially impact is how many lives have you changed? Yeah, that's a wonderful. I like that one, yeah? How, how many put lives have you changed? That's a great measure, right? So normally when you ask that question, you get sort of, oh, impact is simple. That's citations to papers. Um, yeah, so okay that is one way of measuring impact i guess on other academics other people say how many tweets yeah other people say well what what is your ranking yeah. but i'd like to think you know what 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 are the changes in the world that go back to your ideas so there's sort of how many lives have you changed that's a great measure um, but you can you know maybe maybe your research doesn't save lives i don't think my research saves lives i think hopefully my research is making some parts and some experience for some people better. And I wanted to give you one example, which I think is astonishing at the moment. In Germany, a very big name is this person here. Yeah, this person is Christian Drosten, and he's the head of the, um, the basically the institute that, that looks at the corona pandemic and is advising um, the, the, the government. Yeah? So he's doing a lot of impact in the sense of that he's doing a, a daily podcast to people where he's informing the, the German population of 80 something million people. He's um, advising the uh, governments, regional, state and federal. Um, he is uh, talking about how we can interpret all the different signs. Um, and of course, he's, he's an epidemiologist, right? So he studies um, the, the virus, etc. Right, so he's really, really spending an incredible amount of time and trying to change the lives of people and inform the population, right? So, and what I wanted to show you is, these are his Google Scholar citations. Look at that, yeah? So when you look him up, he now has 50,000 citations, 26,000 are from 2020, 26,000. Yeah, that's, that's twice my career and he's done that in one year. Yeah, so he has a couple of papers that were published this year and that already have thousands of citations. So what I'm saying here is this impact and engagement is not an opposite. It's not an either or decision. It goes hand in hand. Yeah, so he creating impact is all into the world is also helping him creating impact as an academic and vice versa. Yeah, so really want to encourage you and I really would think that Michael is, is, is touting the same horn here. Um, that you live and breathe engagement and impact. I find it to be a wonderful model that I've learned at QT some 15 years ago, and that is only getting relevant and more relevant to this day. So this is the perfect time in your lives, in the life of academia, to be practicing engaged scholarship. When I started, that was an abstract idea. It was touted by a few people and no one did it, very simply. No one did it and everyone wrote nice editorials about, oh yeah, that's something we could do. Right now, this is basically the method, the research approach of choice where everyone loves people doing this. And you'd be surprised how 
few institutions, how few scholars, students and professors really practice it. Yeah, academia is a very slow industry. So if you think that this is bread and butter because you've heard it 10 times from Michael already, keep in mind that outside of QT, this is not a standard model, but it is a wonderful model and it helps practice and it helps your research. Yeah. <clears throat> so I had an example from work that I've done, but I'm going to skip that because I'm, I'm running. Um, the example is about positive deviance in, in, in bakeries. And the only point I wanted to make there is this is a topic where we can pre practice impact. We changed how the bakeries look like, how the people work there, how people shop there. It has nothing to do with my area. There's no technology here other than an, a bakery oven. Um, <clears throat> But you know, it's a wonderful example of an engaged scholarship where you create impact first and papers later. But, but I wanna get, get towards the end. So I wanna talk a little bit about being a bit more programmatic in your work, right? So I will, for some reason, out of the many things that Michael said to me, this one really stuck for me. In my final year as a PhD student, when we had a meeting and we talked about, okay, what, what are you gonna do? And I said, oh, you know, I'm almost done, I'm sort of, getting a little bit easier. I'm just writing up and I don't really have much doing. And, and Michael said, well, prepare for your post PhD life. Get a second, I think he called it a second life, like get a, get a second stream of research going. And I said, oh, you know, I'm busy with my PhD. And he said, well, you'll never again have as much time to learn new things, methods and techniques than you do now. And that's not only true in your PhD, that is true in any part of your PhD, in your, in your academic career. Yeah, at any given point in time, you think you're busy, but you'll be busier later on. That might be in Korea. So if Michael mentioned when you take over editorial work uh, or do other services, they are incredibly time consuming. They're very rewarding, but they take a lot of your time. And that, you know, that time has to come from somewhere. I'm now a middle-aged man. So I have a family with three little kids and that takes time. So I just, I'm not a 26 year old student anymore that has basically only sports and his, and his PhD ahead of him, right? So it's a wonderful time to learn and do more now and to start thinking programmatically. And one of the things that really helped me is that I always tend to think of my work as a, as a portfolio, a portfolio with many buckets, you know? So that means I tend to have three buckets. Three buckets are number one, new ideas, yeah? So when I plan projects. The second one is research is underway. And with underway, meaning um, we're out there collecting data or we have data collected and it waits to be analyzed. So really in the midst of doing research. And the third part is writing about research that's been completed, but it's not published yet. So we need to write a paper, we need to revise a paper, you know, we need to resubmit it and whatnot. So we have three buckets from ideas to execution to writing and, and I'm always keeping that as a portfolio. This is what I do. And I want to make sure that I always got something in my buckets. Yeah. So before we get there, one of the key things you can do with such a portfolio view is you number one, you can keep track on it. This is my portfolio tracker. It's a, it's a stupid Excel table with a couple of uh, tabs. Um, so the, the bottom one are, is my writing tab. So these are papers that are, you know, somewhere under review and I'm, trying to keep track of them. I'm trying to keep track of them where I'm involved or where I'm leading, what the status are when I've heard back and so forth. I'm just trying to keep an, an information system here. The, the, the top sheet, what you can see there are my ideas bucket, yeah, my planning. So these are ideas for things that we are planning to do. Um, and it's sort of at some status, you know, more or less advanced, I guess, right? So it doesn't matter. You have to don't do this one, but you have to find a way of keeping track of your portfolio somehow, right? I'm, I've, I just started using an Excel table 15 years ago and I've kept it ever since. The, the key things about this portfolio view are number one, you make sure that each bucket is, is something in it, but it's not too full. And, and of course, also not empty, empty either, right? So if you have five ideas, but nothing to write about, that's a problem, right? If you have uh, six studies that are underway, but no new ideas and also nothing to write about, then you have a problem, right? So you got to manage the flow of them. So you got to have an equal thing to keep in your portfolio. And the key thing is this, the key thing is that in each bucket, you have to do different things. So in planning, you need to be creative. You need to develop good ideas. In execution, you need to be rigorous. Yeah, you got to make sure that you adhere to procedures for data collection and analysis. And, you know, you need to look at the data and stuff like this. And writing, well, you need to well write. So cognitively, these are three different 
uh, efforts that we need to put in and all of them are mentally draining, but they're all very different. So one of the things you, it allows you to do is when you have to write and you get stuck in your writer's block and you really can't go forward, you say, okay, well, you know, I'm going to pause this bucket. I'm going to go to my ideas bucket and be a little bit creative here. And when I'm fed up with this, I can go and, and crunch a little bit of data. Yeah. So writing papers and, and working out statistics here with R or SPSS and here with Word. Two very different things. And when I get fed up and, and, and bored with this and stuck, I would go here and I'd spend a few hours on doing this. So you can move a little bit and it makes you very efficient in progressing all of the items. Number two, of course, you need to make sure that the items work across the portfolio from left to right. They gotta move. They gotta move from planning to execution to finalization. You need to finish the project you started. And that also means you gotta work on the thing that is closer to being finished. One of the things you will notice is that new ideas are always seem more attractive than things you've already worked because they're shiny and new and idealistic. And as soon as you go through execution writing, you know all the holes and the problems with this. But the reality isn't as nice as the idea. But you know, these ideas on the right, when you're in the writing stage, they are closer to being finished and adding to your portfolio, to your CV, so to speak. You got to work on this, right? So a simple rule of thumb is revisions are more important than new papers. Always prioritize the revision of a paper over writing a new paper because it has the bigger chances of getting accepted, very simply. Yeah, discipline is critical. And as you grow your portfolio, you won't be doing everything by yourself. It means you need to manage your co-authors or your supervisors as well. That's your job, not the supervisor's job. If you want something from them, you need to manage that they give you feedback, that they work on whatever you want them to do, et cetera. That's not their job, that's your job. Okay, we're getting towards the end here. Um, with this portfolio view, you can then expand. You can expand mindfully as you do from, as you work from one PhD topic and you see what else could I do? Can I build up a, a second stream of research? Well, there's basically three strategies. You could, you know, maintain interest in theory and explore a variety of domains and methods, or you could be, become the method expert, uh, the case study expert and apply it to all sorts of theories and domains. Or of course, you could become a domain expert, let's say the healthcare expert and very method and theory. It doesn't matter what you do, but the key thing to take away here is that you wanna fix at least one of these variables and very only one or two of them, yeah? So if you move from survey research in healthcare to case study research in consumer shopping applications, you start afresh. And that's not a bad, good idea because you, you don't know the literature, you don't know the methods, you have to start again with your hygiene factors. But if you know the hygiene factors for your methods, it's very easy to then hop across different domains and apply it there. Yeah? So in expanding, the key thing is to keep some of the variables constant and only very a few of them selectively. So for example, I for a long time stayed in the same domain um, and also same theory, but a varied method. So I started with survey, then I moved into case studies, then I moved into experiments, but always in the same domain, same theories, which is really good because I don't have to read up on them again. I already command them, right? And I only had to read up on the, on the methods and that was hard enough, yeah? And that brings me to the end. Um, and so these are the three things I really want to you to take away for optimizing your PhD. And my final slides, I just uh, a few just golden rules that I want everyone um, sort of to think about because these are some values that I want, want to live by. So I mentioned this before, read, 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 read. Reading and reading breathes writing and this is a key skill for academics. And as I said, it's one that we don't necessarily teach. Also in this profession, you can do what you want to do, not what others want you to do. That is a key differentiator of our job in comparison to many, many others where we are told what to do. No one really tells us what to do here. So make sure that you, that you live that. Um, the third thing, which is very important at the moment, especially make sure you enjoy what you do and please look after yourself. Um, this year, especially we've seen too many cases of burnout. I've seen as a program director, too many cases of anxiety, of stress, all of these are real problems and real challenges for academics and especially PhD students. You gotta learn to look after yourself. You gotta make sure that you're always in a good and healthy state. I know this and it's very, very 
relevant to my life as well, that I'm making sure and I've learned techniques to keep myself in control and that I look after myself, healthy body, healthy mind. It's really important because otherwise it's just a lot of work, etc. right? If you don't like something, engage and do something about it. Very important. That could be very small locally in your institute, in your school, in your faculty at QT. Um, there's many, many roles that you can take. There's many different escalation strategies. If you don't like something, speak up and do something about it. And of course, don't be busy being busy. Make sure you see progress. Yeah. And that brings me to the very final slide, which means, uh, which is something that a performance coach told me once. And I think it's a really helpful thing to remind yourself. You are all extraordinary and you are all doing very extraordinary things that very, very few people other people on this planet have the chance or the ability to do. Yeah. And we very often forget that because we tend to be in our own circles where you think it might be normal that other people also do research and write papers. Well, it's not. And if you get your first paper accepted at a little workshop, at a little conference, that's not normal. That's not expected. That is extraordinary. That's extraordinary because you're in the top with 0.1% of this planet and you're in the top whatever percent of academics too. Most people do not publish their work. So if you manage to get that done, um, go out and celebrate, open the bottle of champagne, do whatever you want to do, but you know, make sure you don't assume that is normal. It is not. Yeah. So try to celebrate progress, not success. What that means is I try to celebrate more when I submit a paper, for review rather than when I get an acceptance because that I can't control. I can control whether I put in the best paper that I possibly could write. And if I get a paper for revision, I'm trying to make it a lot better. And if I feel that the paper got a lot better, that's really all I could do. So I go and celebrate that progress and whether or not people find it acceptable, I can't control that. I don't know, right? There's other people that look at it and, and they may say yes or no, right? I can't, I can't control this. So that's not my doing. What I can do is I make sure I progress as much as I can. And that's the end of it. And as expected, I'm running horribly over time, but I still think, it, I hope it was interesting to you. Um, and I'm looking forward to some questions. Thank you. So before friends take over, from my side already, thank you so much, Jan. This was incredibly inspirational. And I like how, how normative you are. So, so just sharing insight, honest, uh, and I think also being, being fragile and, and vulnerable, um, but also sharing your insight and, and, and uh, helping us to not just build capability um, and credibility, but also confidence. So from my side already, thank you so much, but I'd like to hand over to Michael, Leandro, and uh, Ryan uh, to take us from here. Please. Actually, our uh, first question actually comes in. Actually, somebody in the had their hand up already asking about making impact. And I'm kind of going through. I'm kind of curious. Um, we talk about learning techniques and um, sort of where you learn from. I'm kind of curious. Do you sit out and figure out how you're going to make an impact with different techniques you're going to look at? Or how do you keep trying to find new techniques and different things to look for? So when you talk about techniques, do you mean impact techniques or? Um... Uh, I was thinking more in terms of learning techniques. You talked about, you know, being 26 and learning everything you can. So we have a, a good toolbox to apply going forward, um, sort of encompassing the two questions together. Yeah. Okay. So about the learning techniques, I mean, number one, uh, what I did back then, I really had a lookout for all sorts of courses that were offered at QT and there were so many, and, uh, you know, I still keep getting all these emails. The RSC does a lot of workshops, so that's good. The other place where you find a lot of workshop are tutorial sessions and workshops at, at, at conferences. And the third thing is really, you know, you go in the library, get a textbook <laughs> and you go on the internet and, 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 and back then there were sort of you know, more or less well-written web pages. These days you have YouTube tutorials on everything, right? So, um, you know, you got to practice a little bit by yourself. So um, I, think th I think that helps for getting the rigorous side under control. You got to read, uh, you read, you have to read outside of your field. So a lot of the, um, the method stuff is not necessarily in your field, whatever it may be, but I can guarantee you that. Um, so that, that's how you can do that, I guess. Impact techniques, um, um, I've tried a few things over the years, I guess. I mean, I've been for a while, I've been incredibly active on social media. I get a little bit more selective now. 
Um, but you know that there, there are sort of broadcasting ways of, of uh, uh, doing this for but you know a lot of things a lot of these things are you got to go out and expose yourself to the people speak at these events speak at a forum hold a workshop at a summit you know whatever it may be these sorts of things which doesn't come natural to a lot of people I know it doesn't for me it's um, I'm very shy in that regard but I still got out and do it one of the things that I do uh, for that reason is I teach in executive uh, classes not because I like it so much, but it, because these are, these are incredibly good steps into the doors of a lot of companies. Yeah, so you make a lot of connections and at the end of the day, it's all about social relationships. Um, and so you got to invest in it, I guess. <clears throat> that actually uh, leads into uh, the second question that came through was actually about um, balancing real world versus academics. We talked about having a lot of real world integration. Um, do you try and figure out a company you can partner with and then sort of look at how you can make an impact there? Or do you sort of say, okay, what's the impact I want to make and then try and find the partnership? Well, I think it... So I think, I do think it makes a difference if you come there with a little bit of a name behind you uh, and you say like, hey, I'm not just, you know, some random guy, but uh, I've been known to do good work and you know so that that doesn't help as a phd student necessarily so as a phd student i think the key thing is you got to go in and, and offer value first and get rewards second what i mean with this is you can't just cold face knock on the door and say hi can i have your data please can i get your uh, cios or your board for 30 interviews on oh by the way i'm going to send you a pdf on my report later <laughs> You know, that's, that's not a good value proposition. Yeah. So the value proposition is you have a problem. What's your problem? I want to help you with your problem. I'm going to solve your problem for you. And once I've done that, you trust me. And then I can, you, you, maybe you're, you're willing to help me. So you got to put in a little bit of effort and, 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 and not only give them like a benefit, a return on investment before they invest, but more importantly, they need to be able to trust you. You always got to see it from the perspective of the organization. They get lots of requests from people that want something from them. They probably also get a lot of requests from, from other students or other scholars that want something from them. So why would they pick you? You know, they're all busy, 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 busy. So half an hour interview of a CIO's time is very valuable, right? So you got to give them something in return. And very often it works well when you start small, uh, help them with something and then maintain that connection. So it's all a bit of a more of a long-term view and a bit of a value view, right? That, that really helps. It also means that you can't wait until third year PhD when you, when you plan to do your, you know, your case study as per your project management chart. When you start looking for the case in year three, you're probably not gonna make it. So if you start in year one and build a relationship, then by year three, you'll be, they'd be more than happy to help you. <clears throat> oh. Can I have, uh, yeah, let me make a question. Uh, first of all, thanks for this valuable presentation. I, I was thinking here, you, you mentioned that you finished your PhD almost uh, 20 years ago. And, uh, 15 years. and uh, I, well, I think one thing that came to my mind is that uh, we obviously see that uh, the amount of data knowledge that is available today that seems to keep increasing. Uh, and of course, it becomes challenging and more and more challenging to, to become updated, to read about everything and uh, acknowledge everything that is related to a particular field. Uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, how do you see this trends of uh, uh, shaping the future of uh, not only a PhD student, but the uh, future of a researcher's life, uh, considering that what do we need to have as new skills, uh, what we need to consider to develop as new capabilities, things like that. So I think, I think it's, 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 it's a good time to be in a scientist at the moment, right? So we see, we've seen a few phenomenal, big global things happening over the couple of, last couple of years, whether it be Fridays for Future, global warming, and other pandemic, where the entire world is becoming very receptive to the work that scientists do. Yeah, so that's good. That's very good. So people are appreciative, and that means also they're, they're being supportive, right? So that is, that is different from 10, 20 years ago. It really is where you had to, you know, explain to people that you're not in the ivory tower, that you can really help someone, and you're not doing theoretical abstract stuff. Yeah, so that, that's a good thing. And there's also more data available. It's also a good thing. 
right? Um, there's also more information available. Um, it, it's technically also a good thing, but with more data, more information, you need to learn better how to filter. Yeah. Um, so I lost track of what I wanted to say. So I think all of these are, are, are pretty good signs for being a scientist. I also think that's not only an opportunity, but also an obligation. I mean, that also means we got to make the most out of this and show the world that, that what we do is very meaningful and very helpful, that we're changing people's lives. Maybe one student at a time, maybe one little case at a time, but we do, yeah? So um, that, that's a great opportunity and obligation. Um, with the filtering of knowledge, I mean, you've got to find a way of, of not only figuring out information, but being able to evaluate the quality of that information. Yeah, uh, the same as society has to figure out a fake news or a troll, uh, uh, um, you know, like a shitstorm from, from from reality in social media. We got to figure out what is good knowledge, what is good and solid evidence, and all and so forth. So I think some very fundamental science skills, like being able to evaluate evidence, being able to evaluate and apply rigor. Um, to figure out and, and talk about abstract concepts and whether they're logical, coherent, and so forth. So just very standard scientific skills. I went out and said, this is the digital age is a perfect time for some very standard field research, right? So very classical methods that are hundreds of years old. I, and I believe that. So if you've got these fundamentals under control, I think you're very well placed to look at the world and look at everything around us. Great, thanks. Uh... Actually, I, I had a second question, but I think it's the same one from the Q&A, and I, I will read here. I think it will be interesting. Uh, uh, it's from Garrett Thomas. Thank you for your presentation. You are very expiring. Uh, most academics begin their vocational life in academia then, and then work with industry as their career develops. Do you have any spe specific advice for PhD candidates who come uh, from industry and have an industry background? background? Um, so, yeah, I've, I've had a few of these students over the years. So, number one, they are very grounded. Yeah, so they know reality much better than, than your PhD student that comes out of university and goes straight on. So, they know this transition from the idea to the ugly reality a lot better. They tend to also to have uh, good access because they, you know, they know companies, they know people, et cetera, and so forth. So, my advice would be to try to, try to leverage these strengths, yeah, um, they typically have a little bit more of problems in rigor and theory, so sort of classic academic skills, because it may have been a few years since they really spent a lot of time reading. So they typically have some catch up to do there, right? So, you know, you can play to your strengths and you try to work on your weaknesses. So that means in the evenings, you pick yourself a paper while you watch TV and you just catch up on reading. And uh, you definitely can create your PhD experience in your research design around your strengths. So if you still have great contacts to your company, well, make the most out of that, you know? And if you still have a great network, well, make the most out of that. So you can, you know, you can, you can play with this and, and let that be part of your research design. So I think they tend to do very, very relevant, very impactful doctoral uh, uh, studies, to be honest. Um, they got to make sure that they got the rigor side under control. That's usually how that works. <clears throat> cool. Uh, thanks, Jan. Um, I actually had a bit selfish. I'll jump in with a question of my own, and then I think there's another one in the Q&A. Um, but I was just curious, you were talking about this kind of portfolio and these different buckets uh, that, that you had. Um, but how do you go about kind of prioritizing or managing the things that are out of your control? So if you're trying to you fill up a bucket with uh, writing or execution or something, but then um, whether it's an ethics application or submitting it, and it's kind of spending time somewhere else for a while but you know do you take something else on and then risk that you've taken too much on and you know do you have any kind of methods for just prioritizing how all those things come well, together I, yeah it, it, that's a very good question i mean number one um by tr keeping track of this for example keeping track of all the ideas the projects that you initiated and, and you know it allows you to see when, when they're not going anywhere that i feel that a lot of people start too many new projects and they can't see them through. And then they, that's just uh, very frustrating for everyone, especially when they're already in the research bucket. You know, so people have invested time and effort, et cetera. The other key thing is, as you put in your stuff, let's say for ethics, and you gotta wait a month or whatever it may take these days. Um, so what are you gonna do then? You know, so when you have a portfolio view, it allows you to switch to a different bucket. Yeah? So you say, okay, I'm gonna put in my ethics. That's good, I'm gonna get that out of my way because then it frees me up to write about this piece or to help this other one. 
right? So you can move across the buckets to make, become very efficient that you're always using the time for something. So number one is you su submit your work from your desk to someone else's desk. So you have to wait. And what are you doing while you're waiting? You can do other things. Um, for me, it's, it's also a bit about mental fatigue. So I, you know, it's very hard to do one thing for a week. I don't believe with these people that say, I've been looking at data analysis for a week. I, I would go really crazy doing this, right? So I can't really stay focused that long. So if you know that you, you're getting mentally drained and you're getting, you know, it's not happening, you're not creative, you, whatever it is, then you can switch to a different bucket and do other things. So you still are very effective in using your time, but not in the same bucket. So you move a little bit more. And the third thing is, of course, you, you, you know, this is, these are on your portfolios, your, yourselves alone. You're usually with other people. So you can also manage the portfolio to making sure that, you know, when your bucket is too full, maybe your co-authors isn't. So you, maybe you want to offload your desk and give it to someone else. And while you have to wait from your supervisor or someone else to hear back, maybe you can do something other meaningful thing in the meantime so it doesn't feel like lost time, you know? So that's, that's why I like this portfolio view on these different buckets because it allows me to fill my time and, and, and be, be productive all the time. Why, for example, I have to wait for someone else to get back to me on that draft and it might take two, three weeks. That's very normal, right? But it's not lost time this way. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. And um, I think it's a really interesting way of looking at it. Um, I think I'm going to definitely try and put something in place uh, in my research. Um, so we've got a question from uh, Nicholas just saying, um, essentially, since we're dealing with disruptive technologies, uh, how do you identify topics of a raising interest um, for academia? Um, and then on the other hand, those topics which are falling uh, from an academic point of view or kind of downtrending from an academic point of view? Well, you know, there, there are... Um... That, that's a difficult one. So I, I am on the skeptical side of these things. Um, so I rather not invest time in emerging technology because I want to see whether that's persistent first, but that's my personal preference. So I don't jump on blockchain five years ago because I felt like, well, you know, I got to wait and see, maybe it's a fad, you know, that's that danger, obviously, that danger always exists, but you always got to remember this, there's, there's organizations that make money on trying to answer that question for you. You know, got a hype cycle in the Forrester reports and all these sort of technology forecasting things. They're trying to figure that one out. And, and, and if you stay close to reality, you see these fringe technologies as they sort of gradually develop. These disruptive technologies are not born overnight. We've been talking about a, a autonomous electric cars for 10 years and now they're on our streets. You know, so that's a 10 year window, not a one year window. So you see some of these things and you can follow them. You can follow them from very early on, you know, you take genetic sequencing, take, I, I, I don't know, take, take a, the quantified self. All of these things are not gradually happening. It depends a little bit on what you want to answer. For some questions, you need to wait till an organization really works with it. So you got to wait. For others, for design people, they want to build the first things. You can start a little bit earlier. So it depends a little bit on that too. Um, and then you've got to figure out whether it's a, it's a fad or is there anything different, uniquely different about these things. So it's the same technology that is adopted like any, any other technology. But, you know, that, that's all fairly, fairly doable. And you can trust some of these hype cycle things, for example. And you've got to figure out where you want to jump into this hype cycle on the, on the slope, on the peak, in the trough disillusionment. I don't know. But it depends a little bit on the question that you're asking. Yeah, and actually, I'm um, just bringing in the next question here. Um, it's actually from uh, Timothy, and it says, thank you for rele sharing relevant and advised information. Um, design science has been argued as a research philosophy that closes the gap between research and practice. The DS approach has strong underpinnings in IS. Mm -hmm. um, do you see the same approach having more relevance in entrepreneurship research? Um, and would yeah. you advise looking at doing a design science compared to IO outside of IS? Uh, absolutely. Uh a very simple answer. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, entrepreneurship is already taken up on it. Um, so you may have seen there's a, there's a paper by Henrik Berglund this year that talks about design science and entrepreneurship. It's not necessarily a new idea. They, 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 talk, they talked about it differently. It goes back at least 10, 20 years, effectuation and so forth. Anyway, so yeah, that's, that's gaining big currency at the moment. It also gains big currency in other parts of management, organizational scholarship. It really does. Um, so design or some sort of building solution orientation. All of these are just different words of people really want to see more solution oriented, engagement oriented 
type of research in any of the business fields. It really are. Right? We, I don't know whether you need to call it design science. It doesn't matter. It's just a word. But this type of research is really, really, really welcome in a lot of places these days. There's no other way to put it. So um, we, look, we do a little bit of design and entrepreneurship at the moment. Um, there's a lot of stuff that you can do in, 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 in sustainable development research. Hello. There's people got a Nobel Prize for their field experiments where they designed interventions and tested them in Africa. I mean, that's huge at the moment, okay? So um, whether you use these concepts or different concepts or different words doesn't really matter. But that type of research, I think, is, is very applicable and very th sought after everywhere at the moment in the business sciences, I think. Yeah. Well, um, I know that some other people have actually had some questions in. So if it's okay with you, Jan, we might actually uh, be sending you through a, an email asking questions. Um, I'm getting a few more coming up and I can see more, I can see private message going, I have one more, just one more, just one more. So um, you might get a few emails coming through from students. Well, my day just started, so I'll, I'll, I'll be here. <laughs> <laughs> nice. nice. Um, also, I, I, on behalf of all the students, and we really appreciate, um, one of the things we want to do with the CFE is actually keep the conversation going. And um, we talk about community and talk about family. And one of the things that CFE has been really doing is with international students, making sure everyone's really included. So to have an international speaker really sort of continues emphasizing that. Um, likewise, we're going to have another speaker for everyone else watching. We're going to have another speaker. Um, we haven't, we won't announce who it is just yet, but I'll continue to keep doing these um, panel discussions. So we want to thank you for being the inaugural and being maybe the best one so far. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> like, thank you for having me. It's a great initiative. Perfect. <laughs> well, yeah. thank you so much. I'll, I'll, I'll pass it to Michael and you can do the quick uh, conclusion there. No, no, that's fine. Well, thank you so much, uh, Ryan, Leandro and, and Michael for sharing this. Thank you so much, Gemma, for, for doing again your amazing uh, background work. But, but most of all, thank you so much, uh, Jan. Um, I, I, I love what you do. I admire what you do uh, in, in, on a global scale. You're a role model in so many dimensions uh, and, and it has been an absolute honor and delight uh, for all of us um, to not just learn from you, but to be inspired by you. So thank you so much. We will stay close to you anyway um, in your role as an adjunct professor. Uh, you raised awareness for a lot of topics, uh, but most of all for your tremendous talent. So thank you so much, Jan. You have a wonderful day. I look forward to having a chat with you on Thursday. And again, thank you from us, from our side, for everyone who joined us tonight. You have a beautiful evening. And as Jan said, take good care. Take good care. Bye-bye. Hope to see you next year. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Jan.